This is Kim Newlove, host of the Pharmacist Voice podcast, where I share my journey from pharmacist to voice actor and interview a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain so that you can be inspired to use your voice too. This is episode 115, and you can find the show notes with links to anything mentioned in today's episode on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. You can also find my medical narration demo and a link to my online course, Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro, on my website. That website again is thepharmacistvoice.com. Today's episode is an interview with Almasa Bass. We have been good friends for more than 20 years, and she uses her voice as a pharmaceutical industry professional and as an advocate for the Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation. There are a lot of pharmacists out there looking to do something different, and Almasa is not in traditional clinical practice. During our conversation, You'll hear about her journey. She'll talk about her pathway from BS degree in pharmacy to her fellowship in clinical research and drug development at UNC Chapel Hill and the various drugs and development phases that she's been a part of. For anyone interested in the pharmaceutical industry, this is a great interview to listen to. You'll also hear Elmasa talk about giving back to her home country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I have known Elmasa for many years, and I must say that I am very proud of my friend. We met shortly after she came to the U.S. as a refugee, and I watched her rise to the successful pharmaceutical industry professional that she is now. I invite you to listen to her story, be inspired, and hear how she gave back to her hometown of Donya Vakuf. In the last part of our interview, you'll hear how Elmasa avoids burnout and what she does for fun. It's lighthearted, and I know you're going to enjoy it. One last thing, Elmasa's opinions are her own. They do not reflect the opinions of her current or previous employers. Without further ado, Here's my conversation with Elmasa Bass. Hi, Elmasa. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice podcast. How are you? Hello, Kim. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. One of my college buddies on the podcast. This That's is awesome. right. And bridesmaid. And bridesmaid. <laughs> That's right. Yes. We go back <laughs> quite a bit. Yes, we do. Oh, did we meet in our first year of pharmacy school or was it the second year? You know, I feel like I'm blanking on that. I feel like it was like one of these big, is it chemistry or biology classes? Um, I think it was probably like end of first year, beginning of second year. Because I remember we we're already good friends in the second year of college. I remember going to um, to Pemberville with you, and I met your parents, and they showed me your high school, and and the downtown, and and it was just so cute. I just felt like so comfortable, and you were just so inviting and and so generous. Your whole family. I remember meeting you, and we were kind of instantly friends. And yeah. now that I think about it, I think it was the first year of pharmacy school. First uh -huh. year for me was 1996 to 1997. Uh-huh. And I remember you were already working at Toledo Hospital. That must have been then probably second year, I would think. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. I can't remember which year what that was the cutoff. Well, I started at Toledo Hospital November of 1997. So uh -huh. let's just say we met in the probably in 1997. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. We're dating ourselves a little bit, but who cares? <laughs> it's fun. And you helped me get my job, my internship at Toledo Hospital. Ooh, you remember that? I vaguely remember. I know we had a training session with Terry and how to draw up the syringes. Um, oh, that's right. We learned how to draw up IVs and break ampules. That's remember right. That? That's right. Oh, I feel like we were already like pretty seasoned by then. But 
but yeah, I just remember being in college and our that second year was kind of crucial. I think that's like people either know if they're going to go into pharmacy or or change their major into something else. But yeah, we stick together. It was a, it was a nice. I just love our class. Everyone was pretty diverse and and was coming from different backgrounds. And you have really good professors. And we moved into the new building, the Wolf Hall. Um, yeah, it was the Wolf Hall, the new building, the new college. So um, yeah, I just have really fond memories of that time. Same here. I enjoyed meeting your family during that time and getting close. And your mom used to make your scrubs, which was awesome. You had yes. smiley face scrubs. I mean, who That's has right. those? They were great. That's right. <laughs> That's right. She was really good with sewing machine. I remember we had, was it the fundraiser for the turkey trot? Yes, did you did your, yes, you did your first 5K with me, which is oh. so fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was never much of a runner. Gosh, I was like, but I remember we were like just totally out of breath. <laughs> but and we had our sweaters with a turkey trot. That's right. I still have that picture. I should put that picture as our uh, our episode artwork, right, Almasa? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gosh, the hair was it like 1996 hair? Gosh, that was <laughs> probably not my best shot. <laughs> Now I'll use a, a professional headshot. I'm just teasing. I, I just wanted to kind of show people that we've got some history and uh, the history led us to the year 2001, where we both graduated with our Bachelor of Science degrees in pharmacy from the University of Toledo. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I think a month later, you were one of my bridesmaids in my wedding in June That's right. 2001. Yep. And, and that was already a time I moved to Columbus. It was just funny because I... I remember our graduation was like on a Friday or Saturday and I started working the very first like Monday after. And I worked my first job out of college was for the at that time was Children's Hospital, Columbus Children's Hospital. I think they renamed it to Nationwide Children's Hospital. So I worked there for about a year and wanted to um, do a Ph.D. in pharmacology and then changed in my major um, into PharmD. So I did the non-traditional PharmD at Ohio State. And at the same time, I worked um, at Grant Medical Center and I learned tons and just was really surrounded with really good pharmacists. They, um, they were just always in, in good spirits and kind of developed a really good social circle. And I learned, like I said, tons just by the, the nature of being um, um, and, and working and practicing pharmacy at Grand Medical Center. So after I, I worked um, and I've finished the, the PharmD, then I started the, the, the fellowship in clinical research and drug development at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So it was a two-year um, two year fellowship program. So first year is spent uh, doing the academia, research in academia. At that time, I focused on uh, cardiomyopathy and endothelial dysfunction studies. So I um, uh, did one year uh, there, but the fellowship itself was sponsored by King Pharmaceuticals at the time. So my second year would have been been spent or we be basically spending at King Pharmaceuticals, learning the ins and outs of pharmaceutical industry and what it means to bring a medication to the market. And then second, um, my second year when I when I did that, um, so that was right after I finished uh, at King Pharmaceuticals, um, decided to stay and, and pursue my career in in pharmaceutical industry. So that's when I I had Reiner, my son, um, at that time. So it took a little bit of a break. And then I got hired by King uh, Pharmaceuticals in, in clinical research or clinical pharmacology and pharmacokinetics and uh, was a clinical scientist for some of the phase one healthy volunteer studies or the proof of concept studies. At that time, um, King was uh, 
more like a small company and was focused on abuse deterrent opioids, um, which is in itself very controversial topic because we do have quite an opioid pandemic here in this country. Um, and uh, uh, like nine months into my employment, uh, the company gets acquired by Pfizer. So I've been at Pfizer, uh, spent six, seven years at Pfizer's and Global Medicines Development Group. And at that point, I also worked on um, uh, Bocosuzumab, which was uh, going to be, quote unquote, the new Lipitor. Uh, the company decided to terminate the clinical development program in the phase, was pretty much in the phase three clinical studies. And uh, we also had uh, uh, one of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, co-developed with Merck for type two diabetes. So I worked on some of those projects and being in the pharmaceutical industry has really opened up my eyes. There are a lot of good, natured, very altruistic people who, who really want to see the, the, the medicines be the best and, and help patients and putting patients into the focus. Um, so yeah, so I spent, um, so I spent like last, gosh, how many years? I don't even know. Um, I don't really even practice pharmacy anymore. I still keep my license active like always like what, what ifs mm -hmm. um which reminds me i do have to probably renew my ohio license <laughs> if I you renew have till september 15th come on Elmasa, let's go <laughs> <laughs> no kidding yeah and then i'll keep my north carolina license um but yes yeah, so and then after pfizer and i've always been in clinical development so this is you think about research and development, the R&D, I've always been more on the, the D side, on the development side, uh, focusing on phase one through post-marketing studies. So then phase one uh, studies, and then phase two or proof of concept studies. Uh, phase three, I love pivotal phase three efficacy safety studies that are really the basis of the ND approval. Um, and uh, um, so I'm trying to just kind of work in the chronological order. And, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I worked on uh, several NDAs and that's quite a need an army of people working on an NDA when you submit the NDA and then get queries from Food and Drug Administration and the reviewers have all sorts of questions. For any students listening to this, what's an NDA? Oh, new drug applications. So um, uh, when, uh, of course, the, you have a potential molecule that you want to develop into um, a, a medication to be marketed medication, then one has to make sure that, first of all, it's safe before it's effective, right? Um, so uh, we first have to do the preclinical studies, the in vitro studies, a uh, lot of, lot of um, depending on, on the, the nature of the, the molecule, uh, carcinogenicities, um, toxicology, all sorts of stuff that usually my colleagues in different lines would, would do. And then uh, that potential asset to be developed then would would be studied and say, I have a first in human study. So how does that molecule absorb in the, in the human healthy volunteer? And usually the healthy volunteer studies are someone who is 18 to what, 40, 50 years old, about two dozen patients in most. Sometimes you'll um, just see the, uh, um, what the kinetics, pharmacokinetics are, what the, um, CMAX or the Tmaxes, um, the half-life, where the volume of distribution. I've done a lot of bioequivalent studies, especially with uh, um, if you have an, uh, uh, an abbreviated new drug application, you want to see if if uh, the, the 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 medication is bioequivalent. 
um, to to the reference product. Um, so um, so that would also be done in healthy volunteers, for example. Then after the the the, the pivotal efficacy safety studies are like the, these phase three double blind randomized control studies, multi center. Um, they would be often conducted in centers or clinics around, of course, the United States, but also uh, around the world. And right now, where uh, I work for UCB, it's a Belgian company that uh, has been focusing really on bringing patient or value to patients living with severe diseases in neurology and immunology. And uh, uh, right now I'm working on a, a, a new, um, well, sort of new, anti, new, the new seizure, anti-seizure medication, Brivaracetam, primarily for Japan, uh, China, and Southeast Asia. So Brivaracetam, or under the name, branded name Briviact in the United States has been approved for quite some time, but that's not the case. Um, around the world. So often have to work on a new drug application, have the, these massive, just massive documents of um, integrated summary of efficacy or integrated summary of safety, have to do studies in different ethnicities. Um, so yeah, so I'm basically working on an NDA working on a clinical strategy with my team uh, that spans across five, six, maybe different time zones. No problem, right? <laughs> yeah, I start my telecons at like 6.30, 7 a.m. Uh, sometimes I have them in the evening. But yeah, it's just the new ways of working now. And it's been like that for a while. Were you flying all over the world prior to the pandemic? Uh, I've I've had uh, I've had few trips. I've uh, been to to Japan. I've been presenting at investigator meetings uh, in in Tokyo. I was supposed to be in China last year. Of course, that's uh, not going to happen. So we had the investigator meeting over the the Microsoft Teams. So that was. Uh, um, it's not the same experience, but it was still better than not having a meeting. Right. Almasa, how'd you learn how to do all this? I mean, was it in your fellowship or did you have a mentor when you came to King Pharmaceuticals? This is not what we learned in pharmacy school. I know we only did our bachelor's together and you did your mm -hmm. PharmD at The Ohio State, but I can't imagine that you learn how to do all of this in grad school. How did this, yeah. how did you figure all this out? I'm impressed by the way. <laughs> oh, uh, it, it's not something like you learn in school per se. You learn it on the job and you have your manager and yes, you have mentors, you have, um, you surround yourself with the team. So I've always, well, I shouldn't say always, but primarily I've been in clinical development and this is where we are responsible for the clinical development plan. Like, so the framework, what does it take to bring one medication? doesn't matter what indication it's going to be and uh, to the market. And what all that <laughs> prescribing information, the USPI, everything's negotiated. Everything needs to be negotiated with the Food and Drug Administration Everything has to be true, supported by the clinical studies. Um, and uh, it, it is, uh, um, it's, it's done with the team. You're part of the team. So that's like teamwork. You're not a single, you're a single entity, but it's working in this matrix environment. You're constantly like rubbing shoulders from someone from stats or someone from safety or from someone uh, with someone from clinical operations, for example, or clinical trial supply. Like how do we get the drug to the site? And we've had, we've had numerous stories where 
where drugs would get lost and, and clinical trial supply would get lost or be held up in customs or then delays the, the clinical study. So if, if things could go wrong, they probably do. <laughs> um, and and uh, you just use your team. You use your team to, to, to drive things forward. Um, you solve problems together. Um, if you focus on timelines, I mean, we're always thinking five, four or five years ahead. Like, when is that timeline for the last patient, last visit in the clinical study? Then how long do we have to wait to get the safety data? Or how long then do we have to wait to clean the data before the database can be locked? And then what all components need to come together for uh, the new drug application before it can be submitted to a regulatory authority, whether it's US FDA or European Medicine Agency, or in my case that I'm working right now is uh, the Japanese uh, uh, PMDA or, or the Chinese NMPA, which used to be called China FDA, but it's now NMPA, the, the national, I'm blanking on it. NMPA is the new China FDA. That's all right. It sounds like you've learned a lot as on the job training. Is that a fair statement? I think so. I think so. It's like the more you do it, the, the you just, also, if you don't know the right answers, you, you, you have people around you, you ask, um, and as far as the protocol writing, there's, usually a chance that a protocol of that nature has been has been replicated for a different asset. So you see that there is a skeleton language in the protocol template. So there's standard language that would be aligned um, what, what goes into the template and then you populate it. And you have medical writers. We have like a whole, every institution has a group of medical writers uh, who will who will do the writing and the publishing and the hyperlinking because these are massive, just massive documents. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see in the totality how the NDA looks like on the other side of the screen if someone, say at FDA, was going to review um, the data. And, and so just a lot of hyperlinking, sometimes even just the 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 minute work, like making sure that it's correct hyperlink, that it doesn't take you to some totally different document. And um, mm. so, so yeah, then you work with stats and programming and, and sometimes you'll be in a meeting where <laughs> for 30 minutes, you're figuring out what the other party is saying until you're like, <laughs> align on, like, wait a minute, what are we trying to do? So it's not always smooth sailing. But it's done. It's it's really done. People do a good work, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that we can stand behind the the integrity, the um, the the data integrity, the safety, and always pass what they call it the red face test. Uh, there's no What's surprise. That? Well, you just don't want to be surprised that or be uh, always want to act with and with. Uh, in an ethical manner, with integrity, mm. um, there's certain codes that you 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 just kind of you just follow. What's the right thing to do? Basically, what's the right thing to do when no one's watching? Even so, you want to do the right thing, uh, and it, especially in such a regulated uh, industry like pharmaceutical industry in general. And I just want to say this, and I probably should have said this earlier, that just for the disclosure. <laughs> All the opinions are my own. It does, they don't necessarily represent uh, opinions of any company that that I either currently worked or or for um, have worked in, for in the past. So this is just I'm sharing my experiences. Um, but yeah, so and I'm still. I think the pharmacy background has really prepared me well for this role because as pharmacists we know so many so many diseases and pharmacotherapy not necessarily all the treatment guidelines but you just know medication when the med you see the name of the medication you know what it's used for um 
And I, I feel like it just prepares us really well for the role in any part of pharmaceutical uh, industry, whether it's in clinical development or safety or regulatory or medical affairs, for example, which is more like externally facing role where you communicate with physicians and PharmDs. And I did um, close to two years, I was a field medical director or the MSL, sometimes they, the medical science liaison for Shionogi. It's a, it's a Japanese company. And uh, uh, at that time, I worked in the area of um, anti-infectives. So you, you're able to shift from one, one disease to the other. Like for example, at Pfizer, I worked even on at King or at Pfizer, I worked on uh, analgesics and, and uh, hyperlipidemia and diabetes. And it, then it was um, infectious disease. Then now I'm on anti-seizure medications or, or the neurology portfolio. So I feel like there are not many degrees out there that prepare you well. And I feel like if I were to do it all over again, pharmacy degree is just so versatile. It really is versatile that I want to tell that even to your other listeners, that you don't have to limit yourself to working at, say, community pharmacy or independent pharmacy or hospital pharmacy. There are so many opportunities out there, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry or often even like contract research organizations that we call them CROs. I may have talked to you about that last year. Um, but yeah, that's basically the 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 organizations that are outsourced by biopharmaceutical industries to run, to do the operational work. Mm -hmm. If they have uh, clinics and contracts and with the, with the sites and how to optimize recruitment and, and get the, get the study finished on time or even sooner. Let me ask you a question. It sounds like when you get into working at a pharmaceutical company, yes, you learn on the job and you definitely work in a team. Do people recruit you to come work for their department or do you see an opening and you apply to it? Or is there some other way that you get into these other different roles within a pharmaceutical organization? That's a good question. And I would say probably both. I mean, you could always start with um, but applying for a job, well, any you go to to, I don't know I'm just saying Pfizer jobs, AstraZeneca, Merck, you name it. Um, you could apply for them, but once you're in the organization, then you can you can apply within within um, within the company for with for different roles. So, like, see if there are any openings, and people do that. What is your experience, Ben? Have you applied for different roles or have they recruited you? I mean, what's your personal experience? Yeah, so at Pfizer, I actually, I, I did something similar where my mentor was in like cardiovascular area, but I was in the anti, um, or uh, I should say in the end, the primary care, called, it's called primary care business unit at that time. It constantly is being renamed, so may not be the same. But I wanted to also work on cardiovascular studies, and that was that was like sometimes they'll you'll have a position being created, and so it's it's networking or or go for the for the the maybe there will be a, a job that will be opened or someone else will leave that role and. Maybe one of your colleagues will move from regulatory into something else or get a promotion. So that spot might be open or so it's very fluid. It just depends. I would say there's not like one single cookie cutter approach. Well, the yeah. reason I ask is that there are a lot of pharmacists out there right now looking to do something else. And somebody with a PharmD who has an interest in working for a pharmaceutical company might find this conversation interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, you get your foot in the door, like you said, and then they might just take you where your strengths go or you yourself will recognize that 
I would like a new challenge. I'm going to apply for this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think oh, networking is the right way to do getting exposed to even like pre-pandemic and depends where you, most of your listeners are. I presume they're mostly U.S., right? US mostly farmers. U.S., India, and the United Arab Emirates. But I have listeners in more than 40 countries worldwide. Hello to everybody around the world. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm so proud of you. You're like such a trailblazer. Like how many pharmacists are out there who have their own podcast. That's pretty impressive. There's a few of us. I mean, I, I've heard there's up to 60 of us, according to Erin Albert's list that she puts out every once in a while. But, mm -hmm. you know, who's counting, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm impressed. That's really cool. Thanks. Thanks. I never thought I'd ever be doing this someday. But uh, the reason I brought you on the podcast today was to talk about how you use your voice You've already talked a little bit about your history working not only as a licensed pharmacist right out of college, but then working through PharmD school and then having a fellowship and working in the pharmaceutical industry. At this point, you are well-established, you're doing good things with pharmaceutical companies, but you also have passions to do advocacy work. So I'd like to hear at this point a little bit about your advocacy work. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Let's see how much time do we have. <laughs> uh, so I don't know how many of, of, of your listeners would know this, but I came to the United States as an immigrant, specifically as a refugee from uh, former Yugoslavia. In the early 1990s, uh, Yugoslavia disintegrated and uh, my home country was really one of the, the republics at that time was the, the Bosnia and Herzegovina. And Bosnia and Herzegovina was one of one of seven states um, that was part of the Yugoslavia. Uh, 1990s, there was just horrible things happening between uh, uh, the different ethnic groups, and uh, my my family and I, uh, my parents and my sister and I, were lived in neighboring Croatia for about a year and a half, but we couldn't go to school uh, at the time uh, because of the, 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 let's say, political or religious differences. So I wasn't necessarily a Croat. So uh, children who could associate themselves being Croat could go, but uh, children who are from Bosnia or who are uh, Bosnian Muslims could not go and at the school and my parents decided to immigrate and find especially with with my mom who was a, a elementary school teacher come from a comfortable middle class family where education and importance of high quality education was extremely valued and uh, president clinton at the time and his administration have really uh been very generous to Bosnian refugees. And um, we immigrated to the United States, uh, uh, pretty much came with four suitcases, uh, knowing that my, my mom or my dad primarily really wanted to go back to his homeland um, after my sister and I really finish schooling and become independent and really establish ourselves in the, in the new country. So I feel like I've been kind of living on this, or have a dual identity being American and being Bosnian, um, have my identity, have my roots. So uh, I've been really thinking about how can I help the youth of Bosnia and Herzegovina and um, Lately, the, the political situation hasn't been the best. I mean, when you think, turn on the news, you kind of wonder, is there anywhere that's kind of a utopia, doesn't look like it? No. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, what can I do to pay it forward or um, pay it back? And I come from a small town. I was born and raised in the town of Donji Vakuf in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it's a small town. Before the, the war, there were about, I'd say, 20,000 people with the neighboring counties and villages. Um, 20,000 inhabitants. I think it's like less than even 5,000 right now because there's just been a lot mm. of 
brain drain immigrants going or people moving out to different countries in Europe, across the world, you name it. Um, and, and to me, there's, there's still prosperity. Bosnia and Herzegovina is such a beautiful country, uh, very small, but just beautiful geographically and ethnically. You have you have um, main religions there. It's kind of they call it like a little Jerusalem of, of Europe. Um, mm. you, so you have um, mainly um, you have Muslims. You have so you have Islam. You have uh, Catholics, you have um, Eastern or Greek Orthodox, and you have, to some extent, uh, um, Jewish uh, uh, population as well. So it's very diverse, very rich in history and cuisine and, and culture, uh, beautiful uh, mountains, and you have Adriatic coast um, that is, is, is just, just stunning. But the, the main prosperity right now is in probably four biggest towns, Sarajevo, which is the capital of Bosnia. Then you have another uh, major town or cities called Tuzla, Mostar, and Banja Luka. And that small towns and small or townships and, and villages and kind of get neglected. And there are so many children who have potential uh, they don't necessarily have the ability, but they have the potential to succeed. Yet there's such economic hardships and 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 uh, uh, political hardships that that are just preventing them to be and and be fulfilled into the best possible version that they could be. And um, I would always look at it as. Like, look, I mean, look at the United States. The United States is such a vast, diverse country. It is geographically just huge. And it's not, it's not just the East Coast. It's not just the West Coast. That's not what makes the United States. It's the also the small towns. It could be like Toledo. It could be Columbus. It could be Pemberville or small towns of... Or, or townships of Michigan and 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 I uh, um, Indiana and and North Carolina is like that is also United States right and uh, to me that's like the vision I had like look Donny Vakov is a small town but to me Bosnia and Herzegovina is not just these four big cities where some pro uh, prosperity happens it's also these small towns and villages and how can we Really bring some something to to um, to improve the 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 conditions or empower the youth. Um, so one of the organizations I've been um, really keen on is the uh, BH. It stands for Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation. And the aim of, uh, or the vision of the Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation is to uh, transform the country into more prosperous a nation that can be uh, responsive to the challenges of the 21st century. And in order to do so, it needs to empower the youth. And how do you empower the youth? You empower the youth through education through technology, through leadership development? How do you develop someone? Some, um, sometimes a kid just needs a little push, right? Needs mm -hmm. to have uh, good role models. And the, uh, the founder and the president of the foundation, Eddie Chustovic and, and his brother are actually also immigrants. Um, they, they live uh, in, in Sydney, uh, in uh, sorry, Melbourne, Australia, and uh, the organization, the foundation, has grown so much. They have uh, mentors that are from forty different countries. Um, they do all sorts of educational programs. And um, are you um, one of those mentors, Elmasa? I I was yes, I was a, a mentor to a, a, a very lovely young lady who was pursuing her PhD in the Czech Republic, in um, 
in uh, cancer uh, biology. And uh, so I was her mentor. And then this uh, other project was with the, the foundation. They were creating maker spaces. And maker space is, uh, uh, is really, um, everyone was like asking, well, what's a maker space? And a maker space is really a place. It's like a physical place for young people where they can learn about the latest technological innovations, where they can grow as young leaders of their communities. Um, it is a space that's equipped with various uh, technology devices that would allow them to apply their knowledge and practice or turn their ideas into business potential uh, to, to help the community basically solve the problems and maybe could develop into something more prosperous. Um, so it's just uh, uh, also finding mentors for, for uh, the youth, for um, just giving them the tools, the right tools, whether it's, whether it's hearing someone give a talk or have webinars or, um, or have the, the makerspace, say, equipped with like 3D printers and laptops and, and other, um, all the techie stuff that I sometimes don't even understand. <laughs> but you want to surround yourself with people like we're engineers and, and computer scientists. And so, so it, sounds, it sounds like a great way to enrich youth. You know, they have school, of course, mm -hmm. but then to enrich their experiences and give them these access to these things, like you're talking mm -hmm. about technology, mentors who teach leadership skills. It's amazing. It sounds like a little bit about like how we have after school programs here. You know, you join a club. Uh -huh. I think that's a good parallel to make. It's kind of like an after school club. So since you're from Johnny Vakuf, did I say that right? You said that really good. <laughs> okay, Very great. Good. And you have been a mentor. How does all this wrap together with where you're from? Um, how does it all wrap together? Did you create a space in your hometown? Well, uh, it's uh, it was a project that we've been working on for a couple of years right now. So um, we had first the the future meetup, uh, like a big meeting. This was I remember it was December of two thousand nineteen. It was at the kind of the. Um, not quite a, like a city hall equivalent, but it's it's like a center, a community center. Oh, well, how about if I put it like that? It will be like a community center where we presented um, the idea and also invited other local businesses. So you want to empower and build relationships with local businesses and, and local companies there so they could, whether it's through the apprenticeship or whether it's through having the networks through the local, the businesses, they could also pursue um, having good relationships and getting good employees or employers that, that could potentially come and work for, for these companies if they educate these, the youth in a, in a proper way. So use the network, use the, uh, the local government. So for example, we met, with the mayor to who first needed the space, right? So it's like you have an idea, but how do you just implement that idea? So uh, another uh, representative from the foundation, uh, Almadin uh, Beganovic, uh, who is really a phenomenal young man, uh, so creative as at the age of like 17, he is, like three startups, he could have easily, if he was in the United States, he would be like an MIT candidate. Like the kid is so bright. And he helped me <laughs> go into the meeting with the mayor of Don Yvakov. So we, we pitched the idea and the mayor liked it. Um, and, and he basically, you, you want to have the, the support of the, the locals there, right? You're not going to come there as someone like a foreign body and say, oh, okay, let's, let's implement this. No, you want to first implement the, and sell the idea and influence that 
why is this good for the community, right? So, um, and, and, and everyone wants to see their children succeed. So it's like, this is just another way that you can empower the youth to, to, to be in sync with, with what other youth and other well-developed countries are doing. And they don't have to feel neglected or they don't have to feel like they're forgotten. And um, so it's just, uh, um, just yeah, just a way for, for them to, to use their, develop their talents, surround themselves with good people, with ideas and, and grow as, as young leaders, future leaders. Um, so, so we met with the, with the mayor and the local government representatives and they did allow us and we had signed a contract. Actually the foundation signed the contract with, to, to give like a physical space with that's within that community center already. Um, it's in the city, the, within the city center. Uh, so it's pretty close to even like the bus station. So children from other towns, would um, could, or could come uh, that would be easily easily to reach, right? And uh, so that was the first uh, that was that was like the first meeting that we had with with there were close to two hundred people at the the audience at the community center that December. Um, we had local, as I said, local um, representatives from um, different business leaders, basically local business leaders. So they could also hear ideas. Teachers, so we had some teachers who brought real good students, potential students from their classes, uh, from middle school, from high school, a um, couple of school directors, and it was really well received. So that that's also published on, on the foundations uh, uh, website and then we finally so this was like right before the pandemic we thought about the uh, opening that was would have been summer of last year but because of the COVID pandemic we put the Donivaco Futures Makerspace into action early this summer or spring and the grand opening with the ribbon cut, cutting was actually this past August. Um, Are you there for that? I did not go. Uh, I did wish I could have gone, but um, due to to everything else happening, so I did follow it on Facebook Live. So I could follow um, again through technology that all the <laughs> things that were enabled. So I watched it from from my uh, my my kitchen with a cup of coffee here in, in North Carolina. Um, Very good. Yeah. Yes. As a, as a recap, it sounds like you were a mentor with the parent organization, and then you ended up helping your hometown of Donya Vakuf make a maker's space right there. So instead of being the hands and feet that really brought it together and, you know, brought the students in and all that, you just helped make sure that there was one in your hometown. Is that right? Yeah, you could say that because I feel like the the part of Bosnia and Herzegovina where I'm from is probably the less developed one. It's called the the it's from the central Bosnia Herzegovina, um, and I, the there were three other maker spaces and they were already in these the bigger cities that I mentioned, like Tuzla. Tuzla is a fantastic city. They have like one of the best medical universities and really good colleges. Um, Banja Luka has one. Banja Luka, uh, that's the the Serbian entity of, of Bosnia. Um, really good. Um, uh, the founder of or the leader there um, uh, is doing a really phenomenal job with that makerspace. So yeah, so I'm like, what what about the small towns? It's not the big cities. Yeah, they they are. It's like the what is the United States again? Like, is it only the East Coast and the West Coast? It's the small towns. America is everything. To me, Bosnia is, is everything. It's not just these big four cities, and, and, but it's these small towns. And um, I wanted to see, I kind of had that idea. I feel like 
that I get from A to Z, but how do I implement that idea? So I needed to surround myself with people who can make it happen. And um, Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation is really doing tremendous work. Um, I have so much support from the diaspora, from even within the country, uh, a lot of just upbeat, energetic uh, supporters. So what's, what's there not to like? Right. And why was it important to you to give back in this way? I just wanted to, to pay it forward. I wanted to either give it back and, and as, a, as a refugee, as an immigrant, who knows how my life would have turned out to be if I didn't have a chance to immigrate to the United States and turn my life the way it is now. Um, but no one, we, we don't get a choice. We were not asked what's our genetic makeup. We're not asked where do we want to be born? When, what time in this vast time spectrum we we need to be born no we we just kind of take it as is and we embrace the positives and and that's what I feel like like doing I just feel like I want to embrace the positives and give it paid forward and and uh yeah so it just feels makes me more fulfilled and if I could help someone reach their next potential or next goal, then um, I think it's just going to be better for everyone. I love the spirit that you brought into what you just said. Thanks for sharing about your advocacy work. Now let's talk about some fun stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Almasa, a lot of pharmacists out there are burned out. And I know that you're not in traditional practice, but tell me, how do you avoid burnout? What do you do for fun? Oh gosh, um, it's a full full question here. Well, I, I start off first with like good nutrition, and I feel like putting good nutrition is a good fuel into my body. Like I'm just very mindful of what I put into my body, and that's why I'm really curious to listen to your other guests who are on on functional medicine and functional pharmacy and being fit and all that. So I think the, the igniter is really the, the good quality fuel you put in. So you have the less peaks and troughs and less sugar that you depend on. Um, Minimize stress. Uh, I'm honestly, the older I get, the more boundaries I start to put in my life. I try to be more kind to myself, to my body, I uh, used to work evenings uh, on almost all the time. I will learn how to say no. I want to say yes. I want to say no. Um, about four years ago, I also started strength training with the, the kettlebells, and I felt like that was very transformative for me. So I've been doing some of the fitness with, with strength training and kettlebells and for the last two years, I've been kind of getting on my family's nerves about CrossFit. Like, I want to be the CrossFitter. So if there are any listeners out there in their 40s who are doing CrossFit, please do share some good uh, tips so I don't get injured. How to start and not get injured. Um, hey, Almasa, I don't know if you know this, but I did CrossFit almost exactly 10 years ago. I broke my right finger on a rubber band. I know it oh, sounds Lord. dumb. I know. <laughs> I had to put a rubber band up to assist myself doing chin-ups because I, I mean, a girl, we usually can't do chin-ups yeah. and that they have these huge rubber bands for assistance. Well, I'm trying to pull this rubber band down and my finger got caught in there and I pulled and I just, I broke my finger. So I'm yeah. just warning you, <laughs> don't be Note a Kim new love. <laughs> Note to self. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, so I think like fitness and walking, like listening to podcasts. Like I said, I love listening to your podcast, listen to some other podcasts. That's Thank you. Just my stress reliever, take a walk, spend some time with my son and my husband. We'll play some board games. And I like being outside. So um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of sustainability and being good to yourself, be good to the earth. and 
I ended up getting backyard chickens and it's been my dream <laughs> for like I don't know how many years and I was always like oh I just need to slow down with my life my work and I had this Pinterest board of of chicken coops so I've been collecting like just inspiration of chicken coops and and I just needed the world to slow down before I would execute my idea and perfect time for it was the COVID. So last summer, uh, I tell my friends and my family, God, that's it. I'm getting chickens. This is the time. I love it. And and, uh, I got my carpenter. I wanted like a custom made coop. I have an idea what I wanted. Um, So the carpenter is this like retired uh, engineer, ex-marine, super meticulous. And he's like, I've never built a chicken coop. I'm like, good, neither have I. So I'll tell you like what I, <laughs> what the idea that I have. Um, and, and we'll just kind of go from it. And he did. It's the most beautiful little chicken coop you've seen. It looks like a little red Ohio barn. I have it? seen it. It is so Ohio. And I think that's <laughs> such a great tribute to where you came from. <laughs> <laughs> and I got four uh, chickens last fall, but they are like, they need to be like five or six months old before they lay eggs. So I got four different breeds and wow. my little four lady birds, as I call them. They started laying (laughs) eggs like in January and I usually get like three to four eggs a day. They're good egg layers. Wow. And we'll like put them in, in pancakes and fry them, make omelets. Um, my cholesterol is just fine. It's not even better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and like, I let them out from the pen like an hour or two before sun dusk. Um, Everyone's like, oh, watch out for hawks. Or there's a fox. There have seen foxes. I haven't seen any yet, but they'll go and venture out all the way to the mailbox. They'll like just <laughs> eat little worms and bugs. And I like they'll go around the compost. So, oh yeah, the compost. Like that, that's another thing. So I'm like, great, like all this chicken poop. Like, what am I gonna do with it? How can I recycle it and repurpose it? So Speaking of the podcast, there is a great podcast called The Chicken Whisperer. So how about <laughs> listening? <laughs> There's an episode on like what to do with all this chicken poop. So it was like over an hour long. And, and I'm listening to this podcast like in the middle of a pandemic and like thinking about the right ratio of nitrogen and carbon that I can have for to get the, the compost going. So I have a big, like a comp, I have two kinds of composters. I have the the tumbler, like that's the tumbler. Mm-hmm. You probably have seen some homes, uh, some homes that have the tumbler compost, and that kind of speeds up the break breakdown of the ingredients of that organic matter uh, a little bit faster because you introduce the aerobic process, or you could just kind of have this big pile, like in your backyard and you just keep piling on stuff but that takes slower to decompose because it's an anaerobic process at least that's the way I understood it so yeah I'm like making now the compost and my next project is to get that a little vegetable like a garden so um whether I, I may actually do that try to do that myself I want to do something with my hands so I want to like get like a hammer and nails and just I don't know YouTube like the, I'm sure there's channels out there and episodes on how to make a garden bed and make sure a raised it's, garden bed probably a raised garden bed yes and, and how to use that organic matter and 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 grow fully dense nutritional vegetables and I just want like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers because that's like my staple I could just live on good bread and tomatoes every day so what about chocolate Elmasa 
and oh, coffee. Gosh. Yeah, <laughs> coffee. Coffee's a must here. Yes. See? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Even in college, you loved coffee. I remember <laughs> that. I went over to your parents' house or their apartment back in <laughs> Oregon when we were going to college and your mom offered me espresso. And I'll tell you, I come from a small farm village. I didn't know what espresso was. <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. You told me it was like coffee, but in these little tiny cups. Oh, it was probably like the Bosnian coffee, like that little Turkish coffee. Yes. yes I think I tried it once and uh, all due respect, it wasn't for me, but I just always remember you loving coffee and chocolate. So I know you're talking about the health food. I don't mean to mm-hmm. ruin anybody's impression of you. I'm <laughs> sure you're plenty healthy, but I have some great memories of you eating less than healthy stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes. Of course. Of course. Yeah. We were yeah. kids, right? <laughs> oh, well, I, I never take anything out of my like nutrition. I, I don't necessarily diet. It's just, it's like my mantra. It's how I live. It's, if you can get the nutrition nailed down. Um, That's I mean, 80% I, of your yeah. health, really. And, Absolutely. Uh, eating clean food. And mm. it's like that there's so much processed and un like ultra processed food in the the grocery store. I feel like this is like pandemic in a sense that we fuel or the big ag or the big food companies fuel these pandemics, whether it's the the corn lobby or um, yeah, just a lot of um, diabetes that could have been prevented. Like maybe you wouldn't need that metformin or, or insulin if we just, look at what we eat and what we put in our bodies. So, um, yeah, so I feel like that's, that's even as, as a pharmacist, if I'm wearing my pharmacist hat, I'm approaching that from like, what did we first put in our body and then what, what we need to truly treat. Yep. Absolutely. You make some great points. Now going back to avoiding burnout and having hobbies, I think we all need something to look forward to. And one of the things that you mentioned was board games. Mm-hmm. And you and I share a love for a particular board game. Can you tell me about what what that is and what is your favorite version of it? Oh, yeah. So Ticket to Ride is one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have the... the um, we have the Europe one and we have the US version. Um, and since we, there was like three iPads in the house, sometimes we'll all be on our iPads and do the, the iPad version. But I like, I like just touching things. And so I like the, the traditional board game, like set it up on the, the kitchen table on a rainy Saturday afternoon and we'll like play board games. Yes. Uh, Monopoly, I used to play, actually I used to play more Monopoly with my son. Um, he was good. He would beat me. He just needs to build like three (laughs) hotels and I need to just land once and I'm done. I'm totally done. (laughs) I feel Um, you. My son does that to me too. (laughs) And our latest one is uh, Catan. So we like that one a lot. And then you recommended um, Caverna, but Caverna takes like an hour to set up. So by the time we set it up, I'm like, okay, let's just do something else. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Masa, you have got to get your son to do it for you. That's all, all there right. is to it. Just trick all him right. into it. Like there's some M&Ms in this for you, kid. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Note to sell. Yes. <laughs> no, but seriously, I wish that we lived closer because it has been awesome starting a friendship 20 plus years ago and going through all these life changes, you know, going through college, becoming moms, staying friends, celebrating things that we look forward to and enjoy. And we exchange cards around the holidays too, even though I celebrate Christmas and you kind of celebrate Christmas. I know that you you have a different religion and it's just been awesome to go through all these phases of life with you. And now that I have a podcast, I get to share you with my audience and share how you you use your voice. So it's been an absolute pleasure going through life with you. I hope to keep it (laughs) going. Let's keep the good times rolling. I I feel the same. Thank you so much. And you've been so kind and you have this, like the most gregarious personality and like you were like, like my dad, you guys love motorcycles. You love talking oh, yeah. to people. You're very non-judgmental. You just embrace everything and everyone. 
still remember that Greek festival that we went to and he got you a beer. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. fun. We're not um, going to cut that out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it Your dad just, didn't know how old I was. <laughs> no, no. And he was like, just, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> um, but it was, it was, yeah, this was just one of your strengths. So I say like, amplify your strengths and use your strengths. And I'm just really fascinated by what you do with your voice and how you use it for um, whether it's to, to help with Craig's needs or whether it's to, to be a better pharmacist or just put the collective minds together and make us all better. Well, thank you for sharing that. I am flattered <laughs> by your compliments. Well, thank I you mean, for sharing how you used your voice as a pharmacist and as an advocate for your, the charity that you support, and also for sharing how you use your voice to avoid burnout. <laughs> you know, I think that is fantastic that you shared all these things that you do to help help yourself stay healthy mentally and to engage your lighter side. That's great. Is there anything else you'd like to share as we wrap this up? Yeah, if, uh, if um, some of your listeners want to connect with me, if they have any ideas or any questions, I'd, be, I'd love to, to connect with them. And I am on LinkedIn. That's probably the one social media that I use probably more, more um, than others. I'm on uh, Instagram and Twitter, but like Twitter, I'm not very popular. I got like, I don't know, 20 followers or something. I, I just don't do the social media as often and kind of going back to the boundaries, things that I mentioned. So I try to limit it as, as much, but yeah, LinkedIn would be great. I would really like to connect with some like-minded pharmacists or your listeners. Thank you, Kim. And can you share the website for the organization that you've done some mentoring with? Yes, yeah, so this is the bhfuturesfoundation.org. Very good. I'm sure there's a couple of listeners that would like to take a look at that and learn more about it. Well, thank you, Elmasa, so much for being on the Pharmacist Voice podcast. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it, Kim. I was being pet. Thank you for listening to episode 115 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Almasa certainly has an interesting role as a pharmacist working in the pharmaceutical industry. As you heard her say, her pharmacy background has served her well. She has certainly embraced the educational opportunities available to her, and I admire her for wanting to pay it forward to the youth of Bosnia and Herzegovina to have opportunities as well. Congratulations to the BH Futures Foundation on your new space in Donja Vakuf. May it serve your community well. As we wrap this up, I want to say that it has been an absolute pleasure sharing my conversation with Elmasa with you. She is one of my closest college friends. I have so many memories with her and pictures of our adventures over the years. Keeping in touch after graduation isn't easy but I'm happy to say that we're keeping the good times rolling. I hope this episode has inspired you to reach out to some of your good college friends and learn how they are using their voices. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to read the show notes. You'll find links to Elmasa's LinkedIn profile, the BH Futures Foundation, and more in those show notes. Thank you again for listening. 